uh, specialized in civil works, building dams and sewage systems, bridges and so on. And back then tendering was super competitive. And, um, you know, there was a simple lesson was uh, the non-negotiable no accountability for when you messed up. And ultimately your reputation was everything. And, and that was a big one for, for me, very early years uh, to have come to learn that. So very unlike um, things we read about today in the newspaper. So, uh, yeah, as an immigrant, he, he, he came in the, 19, in the 60s uh, with no opportunities. He, he took some big risks. Um, he surrounded himself with a very loyal team. He was armed with his vocational skills. Uh, he was a specialist formwork uh, maker, so he used to make the molds for bridges and weirs over pipelines. He couldn't speak any English. Uh, he, was, he arrived uh, and learned to speak Ovambo first, which is the local language in Afrikaans, and then English. So it was quite remarkable. Um, and then in the early years, he started when he started his own construction company, one of the things I learned uh, very early was the disappointment on his face when he had his first concrete mixer stolen. And um, subsequently, since then, he actually carried on his business and recruited and trained the refugees from Angola in the 1970s. There was a civil war. And um, with these guys, these highly skilled mechanics and operators, they uh, turned the business, they turned a business into a proper business, into a civil's business, and ultimately started manufacturing their own bricks and curbstones and quarry materials. And, um, they manufactured their own formwork, uh, literally in the molds. Um, earth moving equipment uh, was made from profits made from previous jobs. And ultimately, everything just went back into the business. So everything that they did just went back into the business. And, and lifestyle was what it was. It was very simple. We never went on holiday much. Actually, we stayed in the in the country. We, we actually never went on holiday. And as long as there was a, a plate of food on the table and a roof over our heads, we, we, we were happy and the business was going. So I say this because this was an important lesson for me growing up, that um, the yards are, the hard yards are done at home. Um, so, you know, most of the work was right, right up north in, in Namibia. Uh, the closest hardware store was 700 kilometers away. So one can just imagine the logistics that went on with an operation like that. Um, we'll get to logistics later, but ultimately his, his job uh, was, was to re-sanitize towns. So uh, he did uh, Ondongwa or Shokati or Nesi and Kamenyap. And if you're familiar with any of these towns uh, during, during a period of infrastructure spend in, in, the, in the, with the South African government. And I don't know if I can share maybe a little picture with you guys, but just give you an idea of it's nothing remarkable, but um, you can see there uh, little quarries there and concrete mixes. It was very normal days. And the interesting thing is a little picture down here on the left side. That was uh, one of our machines hitting a landmine. Um, there was no jokes. Uh, we, we, uh, this was a time of extreme and very turbulent time in our history. And um, this, uh, obviously our South African government was up there trying to protect the country from the fear of communism, whatever it was. Uh, there was all kinds of things going on. Independence, fight for independence, propaganda, two oppositions fighting over mineral controls in Southern Angola. It was a hot pot, a crazy time. Um, I don't know where the history sits with this, but uh, it's, it's kind of like we were in the middle of, these, of, this, of this madness. And I, I really learned that, you know, keep your nose clean, stay out of trouble, and don't get too involved with, with local politics, you'll be just fine. Um, then, uh, you know, some of our vehicles, we had anti landmine vehicles there just in case we had landmines. And in the 25 years we were there operating in that area, we didn't hit one landmine. And that was thanks to a really good relationship with the local population. It was so cool. And um, they just really looked after us and we kept, uh, we kept looking after them. And uh, one of the things you had to do when you walk, when you drove around those areas, especially during the when the pans were flooded, is you just followed the pipeline, and the pipeline was a little bit higher than than the normal. Uh, you kind of like followed a almost like a berm, and as long as you stay in the pipeline, you're quite safe, because um, water pipeline was the lifeline, I suppose. And um, that, that 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 was a was a, a relatively good lesson for me to have learned early days. Um, the, yeah, my, my old man was a very, very 
visionary. He was a visionary. He was he was neutral. He was quiet. He was kind and extremely caring. And and I had minimal care in my life at the time. Uh, I had a swimming career. Uh, I had, uh, I didn't do too well at school. It wasn't my greatest asset thing there. And I played soccer as a teenager for 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 for, for Namibia twice. And um, so it was all good. And things were going swimmingly. I even went came down to Cape Town doing architectural studies. And then my third year, life turned itself around for me. And uh, that's where my dad suddenly passed on from cerebral malaria. And I had to go and take over this business as a 20 year old. And um, so I packed my bags and took the bull by the horns. And what can I say? You know, there was little time for mourning and there was more families to look after, hundreds of families that were dependent on my positive and immediate actions. So stepping into my dad's large shoes was no easy task, I tell you. Um, understanding to dig deep was, was extremely difficult. Uh, you were, I was a kid, not much worry in the world, and um, would catch myself sitting in an old wild fig tree in, 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 the, in, in the north in Namibia, they're crying, sobbing my eyes out, night after night. And I suppose being in that solitary space for weeks, it, it, it helped me heal and find strength to continue. And it was thanks to my dad's foreman. They were, from, they were two guys from an old Buster tribe, an old German secretary. They, they kind of like tucked in behind me and, and they really just helped my hand through this ordeal. We eventually finished the job. It was quite a large job. Uh, it was basically the AC communal facilities as well as the schools and hospital. Um, and um, in those days, it was 1989, the, the job was, 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 was valued at 10 million rand. If you future value that today's money, it's like half a billion rand. And, you know, headed up by a green 20 year old. So I, I share this with you because it was quite important. I'd learned the management of skills management quite early. Um, and also to remain honest and loyal to the people that, that stood by me. There, there was an extremely important lesson. And to this day, I carry this, this with me. Um, so maybe some take home gift value for you guys is the importance of, of just surrounding yourself with honest and loyal people. And um, because they become very paramount to your growth. And also um, to readjust yourself all the time. You know, there's a saying that goes as uh, you know, an old pilot. There are old pilots and there are bold pilots, but there are no old, bold pilots. So um, digressing a little bit. Moving back to Lumberland, so 1990s, uh, that's the time that um, uh, it was 1989 to so 1990s, enter uh, Lumberland, the work, the work dries up, the army moves out, and the independence is in play, thanks to Resolution 435. And it's at this point that um, I'm sitting with this enormous workforce, tons of machinery, and absolutely no work, just nothing. And, you know, people need to get paid, and they want to eat. And... Um, so the little work that was around, I, I had no tendering skills and, and it was thanks to an old friend of my dad. I, I actually stepped in and I asked for help and, and, and he did. And he came to the party and he helped me to understand how to gather information, understand methodologies, how to value engineer. Um, and just those little old man's tricks, you know, to, to win contracts. And, and he, I could say in many ways, was my early, early mentor. He, um, I, I think I did mention his name, Arthur Preuss. Um, and he helped me make some fundamentals, some fundamental decisions. And one of them was like, hey, you got all these machines, just why don't you give some of them away? And it was easier to give it away than to sit on it. And, and, and this is, remember, this is like my whole world. For 20 years, I've been, my dad had been preaching to me, reinvest in the business, rebuy. But ultimately, you also end up with this, with, with this huge burden. So I, I, I gifted some of the machinery to, to our loyal staff and some operators. It was also a way of saying thanks for being there next to me all this time. And they went on to start their own businesses and they became small entrepreneurs of their own. And uh, to this, and, and, and it luckily, as luck would have it, uh, there, was, became what, there was a lodge boom around that time. And um, in the Tosha pans, the Kola, Coca Felt and the Caprivi. And it was great relief for me that these guys were able to to, to get this work and, and to build up these, these lodges. Um, lots of foreign capital came into the north of the country and, and these guys today are, are living a relatively good life. And, and for me, um, I suppose it was also a stroke of luck 
the Namibia, Namibia was then known as the Switzerland of Africa, Switzerland of Africa and United Nations had come in for as a peacekeeping task force. And they were looking for people to, to, to build embassies. And, um, and as such, uh, I attended for the British and the German and the French embassy. Um, and, and as luck would have it, we didn't, I didn't get one of them uh, because they were just didn't trust locals and had espionage issues. But I did land two. Uh, <laughs> interestingly, I landed the East German embassy and the West German embassy. And, and they were literally across the road from each other. And it was crazy, uh, the declaration I had to make and, and, and how they each would have their own analog um, radio systems and they, they would be spying on each other from across the road. And, um, and, 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 <laughs> and it was crazy. And they would have a beer that afternoon together. But it, it was about that time that the Iron Curtain had collapsed and the East Germans um, literally one day after the next just packed up and left was the Berlin Wall had come down. And, uh, and I'd asked, you know, I went across the West German embassy and I said like, who's gonna pay my last check? And, and literally there and then the West German ambassador wrote out the check for the East Germans. Um, needless to say that the East German embassy was never occupied. I mean, this was a, a serious double security, non-penetrable bulletproof system a, a, a embassy that was extremely, uh, it was done to, to Cold War standards. So, Typical lesson there for me was governments just do waste money. That's it. Um, I'm going to be cautious in delivering my message to you today to you guys because in life stories, you know, it can be compressed data, sometimes forgetting with astonishing skills the uncomfortable moments. And, and I'm trying to reach to you with also saying to you that there has been a lot of uncomfortable moments in my day. And, 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 and I'm hoping that this narrative comes across to you. Um, you know, the, the pond in Namibia became too small for me. Uh, uh, I was getting as the son of Afrikaans Vinchat. And I then decided to migrate the business to South Africa and attended on some work. We won the Heidelberg Primary School, which we built. This was 93, 94, and then the Wingfield Prison. Um, and it was about that time, another uh, turning point, uh, Mandela was released out of prison. And um, again, the economy came to a standstill. No one knew what was going on, and um, all infrastructure projects had dried up. Um, so I thought, well, you know, what are we going to do now? And um, in, the, in the 80s, my dad had wisely invested in a small commercial building in Cape Town. Uh, it was empty. Um, and, and I pitched for some office accommodation for the Regional Services Council, Justice Department, and we had won some of it. So there was one tenant, there was one tenant right at the top. Uh, it was Trillion, I'll never forget that name. They were a production studio and they used to make ads for, for clicks. Um, and uh, we had come to some arrangement that we worked outside the hours and while we were doing this refurb work. Uh, somewhere one of the subcontractors messed up and, and, and overran some of the hours and we ended up getting a lawsuit. It was a horrible time. They uh, sued us for production, for loss of production, um, and it was extremely opportunistic. Um, we went to our attorneys, and they were equally opportunistic. Um, entered into a court case that ran for days. And, and let me tell you something: when you're employing advocates uh, in a bench with lawyers, it's it's a daily run rate of notes. Um, it was seriously expensive. It kind of like almost bankrupt, bankrupt. Uh, it, it almost liquidated us to use uh, more modern terminology. And um, the twist of the story was that we initially we had lost the court case and then on appeal, uh, we won the court case with, 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 with uh, damages. And then the, bull, the, the tenants just folded. They folded their business and declared bankruptcy. Um, I represented attorneys who should have asked for security at the time. Uh, I tried to hold our legal firm accountable. Turns out that I, could, I had no claim. And, and that was that. And I was only 25 at the time. So here it is, down, up and down. Uh, a few million bucks up in Namibia. And then in Cape Town, a simple thing like trying to refurb a building took, took, took some bucks out of, the, out of the equation. And so maybe a little lesson for you guys, stay out of court uh, if you can. Always try to find a resolution. Um, at all times, just find a legal, just find a way to, to, to make peace. And um, 
yeah, I mean, the, the, the aggravation that comes with it is just, just, just not worth it. The emotional scarring that you leave behind, in, it just still to this day haunts me. And I speak with hesitation when I even talk about it today. So I, I, I managed to uh, get myself overseas for, for a few months and I visited a friend in New York. And he, he stayed in one of these uh, reurbanized, well, shall I say, in, in, a, in, a, in a warehouse that he was actually living in. And in those days, it was just weird who lives in a warehouse. And, so it was the start of the reurbanization of the West Village um, and, and the meatpacking district. And, and I kind of like saw it, I saw this was happening and I thought like, who would want to live here? And, and it was just a vibe, it was just like so trendy and it just, just made a lot of sense to me. And I came back to Cape Town, this was now the mid nineties, remember, 95. And the city of Cape Town was no go territory for, for accommodation. And I ended up uh, transacting and I bought a building called the Bulma building. And um, it was, a, a a textile factory and my brother and I went about uh, converting this in, into, into apartments and and, there, and um, yeah there were no bars and restaurants those days so our first conversion was a multi-level uh, and we put a two two-story light steel frame structure on the top and and can you believe it we sold two bedroom flats with a parking bay for like all of 99,000 rot. Um, and yeah, I suppose in many ways it was the start of the inner city living mini boom. And uh, we were followed very quickly by every developer um, with their socks looking to buy buildings up and down the road to convert uh, into, into Resi. It was a proud moment for me and it, it did take a lot of guts, but it just made all, all the sense in the world. And, and it just felt right. And, and I sing praises to a guy called a man called Richard Abrams says, a local town planner. He patiently guided me through this time. And um, so we, we kind of like, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, a, it was, a, was a strange moment, but it, it just was, it was crazy that, that one would think that, uh, you know, something that was almost, it's almost like where we, we are today. Like, it's almost like a doldrum town, like nothing was happening and, and you can actually turn this into, into a life of its own. And it was at that time that I invited a friend of mine, Martin Epstein, into the business. Uh, in, well, basically, he was doing his article clerks, um, his article articles at, at, at Merz Rowland. And, and he joined me and we formalized the development company, which is today called Swish. Well, my brother continued with the building company. And um, so we navigated some interesting times. And um, one of the first schemes we took on was we just took a, uh, we put a, an offer on a piece of land in High Cape, it's in Freda Hook. And um, we, we, we basically, Murray and Roberts thought we were like, not, you know, like who are these youngsters and, uh, you know, but they gave us 21 days to come up with a guarantee. And then Martin, to his credit, came up with a brilliant co-developer scheme where we went to our friend's family and uh, asked them to put up some cash and we, you know, secure the land and we developed this together as a consortium. Uh, we did quite nicely out of it. We ended up making an apartment as profit out of the 24. So that was our first success um, as well. Um, and then like one day I was sitting, I was at home and, and, and my neighbor, I was just chatting to my neighbor over the wall. And he just gave me a great piece of advice. He said like, whatever your planned profits are in the future, you got lucky the first time, just be happy with half because the other half is gonna be taken out with engineering challenges, Weather challenges, unplanned, and, and, and anything, and there's going to be lots of unplanned stuff that's going to come your way. So I thought nothing much of it. Actually, Martin, my partner, ended up marrying his daughter, and um, so we successfully managed to convince Murray Roberts to sell us the remainder of the land. Uh, it was a monster deal. It was a hundred units, and, and luckily we were clever enough to to to. Um, to partner up with a with, with stall, old stalwarts, a company called Belandia, and they helped us do this the old conven the conventional ways they do it today. Like let's do some pre-sales, you know, get up to 75, 80 percent pre-sales. Now you can bank the development, and uh, you can get full bank funding then on the back of that. And 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 yes, we thought we were aware this is gonna we're gonna make this this is gonna this is gonna be great. This is now late 90s. This is now 97, and. Uh, and off we go and we got a contract on board and uh, we started with this massive development. And just at that point, the interest rates ran from, but back then they were already high at 13%, but they literally ran to 23%. It 
Well, it was, again, South Africa's economy came to a virtual standstill and we were halfway in the ground and the interest bill was just ticking daily. It was literally taking up profits away by the basis points by the day. And uh, cut the long story short, we managed to finish the development. We saw it through. And, and, and thanks to our partners we, and, 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 and the, the skills and the legal, the legal, with the legal background, we, we managed to keep all the sellers accountable or the buyers accountable. And um, we walked away literally with, with a zero, zero profit. Um, and again, we consider ourselves very lucky. It was, uh, it, it, it was, we took calculated chance. We thought it would work. We had every reason that it should work, but you know, markets sometimes just do their own thing and there's nothing you can do about it. But you have to learn, you have to put skills and rolling up your sleeves and understanding how to navigate a storm, which comes with experience and time. Often you can get through these things as long as you continue to work honorably and with complete transparency. Um, again, market is dead quiet, I'm moving on. So I'm, because I'm worried about running out of time. We bought a, sorry, let me just show you quickly what that looked like. So that was uh, High Cape over there. To this day, it's just a little bit of a Google image. I couldn't find anything else. And then um, we found some piece of land in Bantry Bay, uh, where we'd been introduced to it by an agent and uh, managed to convince the owner in Australia, an old man called uh, Ernst, Ernst Ford, who was actually also quite a successful architect, to, to sell me the land. But the point, the problem with the land was that it had no access. Uh, it needed to a road to be built. And now you have to build a road. It had a road reserve registered, and one had to build a road through a massive rock outcrop of table mountain granite. Just can you imagine that? So nobody wanted to touch it, but you know, mad Namibians, we thought we could do this thing. So uh, we had uh, two machines. We took it up there. And I thought, well, you know, what's the worst case is that the machines are going to come down in parts. And that's literally what happened. We hammered our way through the rock, ended up building the road. We subdivided the 14 plots. And do you honestly think in 1999 that I could sell a plot for 650,000 Rand? It wasn't going to happen. And to this day, those plots sell for 20 million Rand plus. We ended up selling two plots for 1.2 million. To manage to, we managed to get the road through. Um, sold the plots over the last two or three years after that. Made a little bit of money, but it was a great start, I suppose, in many ways. But today, it's over here. It's the, really the highest road in, in Bantry Bay. And there, all the very, very wealthy people are living. Um, not me. So then, um, yeah, I, I suppose property has a strange way of, of, of going through cycles. Uh, in those days, up until now, it's been fairly predictable or, and unpredictable. Um, and I'll get back to that a little later. But then we developed another innovative housing complex um, called Coral Grove. And then we went on to develop this interesting baby. So that's known as Horizon Bay. It was an old little shopping center. And we thought we'd hit the jackpot here because the time planning rules were very shy on, on description of height. So we thought we'd had the city by the, by the Kovunas and we went and negotiated with them. And we said, okay, guys, we can build a 40 story, 50 story, 100 story building here. But um, we, we think we want to build a 40 story building. So they said, no, 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 it's not going to work like that. So after much negotiation and deliberation, and we ended up settling on a 20 story building, which we then sold out and we got Marion Roberts to build it for us. And um, we were in the ground uh, about two levels underground. And then the piling contractor, I think you guys are familiar with piling contractors hammering away at the and with piles going into the ground. And then I got a phone call from the engineers to say, no, they'd lost a pile. And I said, like, what do you mean you've lost a pile? How does that work? Where is it? They said, no, no, it's gone. So I said, like, there's, it, it's not gone up. It hasn't gone sideways. Where is it gone? It, it literally disappeared into the earth, like, like down. Um, deliberating this thing further, we sat down and then it worked out that it, this particular site sits on a seismic fault. And it's a seismic fault that runs from, to, from Robben Island all the way through to Tilbach. And it was the cause 
for the earthquakes in September 1969. So, the movement had on again all structural engineering and some ingenuity. We managed to come up with an idea of sharing the padded foundations and joined them all up. Uh, and we had uh, what we called a massive uh, pad foundation. So we used to build the pad foundations in, in, in Namibia uh, to deal with flash flooding. Um, and ultimately, it became the start of what we call seismic loading for buildings, which became a necessity after that particular project. And it was, there was, uh, I think, it was the early 2000s, which is now a norm uh, as in, in, in construction. Um, so the scheme, thank goodness, could afford to absorb these exorbitant costs. And um, we, were, we were quite lucky to get away with that, with that baby. Um, so it was an engineering feat of note, I think, and it's quite pretty. And she sits still there uh, gloriously um, at the circle in, in at Dolphin Beach with Table View. So Martin and I then, we continued our different paths. It was time to say goodbye to each other. We had been 10 years together. He went on to Johannesburg and he wanted to do more commercial development there. And I was keener to stay in, in the Western Cape. Another one, another lesson learned there between partners to always remain open, honest in your communication. Um, sometimes there's hard feelings, but those you move on. And 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 that that was was a good 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 lesson, and we still remain friends to this day. So during this time, I'd also been building out an industrial portfolio with some distribution centers. And then um, this was my younger brother, Michel, who had, um, joined me afterwards, after school. And um, with the daughter of a long-standing friend as well, Crystal, she had joined me then after Martin left with, uh, with the admin team. And, uh, and then I met up with, with an old friend uh, called Andrea Taverna. And uh, we just decided to merge our, our, our properties and we continued together to build out a few more industrial port, uh, industrial properties, and um, which ultimately uh, became the listing. And the reason we did that was because it was difficult to be competitive in the tenant arena um, and, 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 and comply with, and comply with glo global standards when your cost of money it was so much cheaper and more available to the, um, to the funds. That were that were that were kept getting the um, these tenants. So we decided to merge our. Oh, during this time as well, uh, I had also joined a friend, Ari. Uh, it was it's called like a dress rehearsal to the listing of Equitas, and we, we listed a company called Vivident, um, which eventually became part of Arrowhead. Um, I parted very soon after that because I just didn't want to be conflicted, and um, then we got. Equitus off the ground in, in, uh, in 2014. But just before that, I received another devastating blow. And uh, my brother, Michel, died um, suddenly of hypertensive hemorrhage. And um, I was stuck again uh, with, with quite a lot to, to absorb. So it was a very, very difficult time for me. And um, thanks to, to Andreas stepping up, he took the lead and eventually we got the, the listing going. So it was a kind of like a bittersweet moment for me. And um, so we started out as a, as a 1 billion grand fund and through many successful raisings from 2014 to 2021 today, it's now a 13 billion rand fund. It's well diversified, it's de-risked uh, to a large extent. So the strategy had worked. It was important at the time for me not to be, um, and I'm gonna go back to one of these, but we had a few of these, that was Adidas's shared Adidas, Adidas warehouse. And then we had a Puma warehouse and I didn't want to be exposed to just one tenant. So the listing kind of like allowed me uh, to, to expose myself across more sort of locations and, and a larger user uh, tenant profile. There were some very interesting learnings during this time, um, mostly around corporate behavior and policies, social ethics, board wrestling, and general governance, checks and balances versus the very nimble entrepreneurial way that I've been very used to. Um, and, and I still do enjoy it to this, to this day. So while that was happening, uh, Crystal and I continued with our um, private neighborhood shopping center, uh, low LSM business. And um, 
that would ultimately continue to this day as it is a um, just slowly building one little LSM shopping center with the other. And, and they, they're quite pretty. And um, there's one of them here in Tipperquesi, uh, near Gubileta, and um, quite proud of that one. And, and we have a few of those. So in short, my interests were diversified. I had uh, some industrial logistics exposure, I had neighborhood shopping centers, and then, then came no, that one. So we had an old building um, in Weinberg and the tenant had left. So what was its default position? This was at the railway line here. It's quite a far away away from UCT. But we came up with it with an I came up with it, we came up with an innovative concept of repurposing this building into student resi, student resi residential, and, and ultimately um, yeah, it's it's kind of like it, 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 it has a story of its own, which I'll I'll share with you guys in in, in, in a moment. Um but just reflecting on the other skew, I think one of my biggest passions was was um, was community upliftment and urban renewal and mixed use areas and mixed use developments and marginalized areas, shall I say. And um, we we assembled a piece of land up here, which is in Salt River. Um, let's just call it an oasis in the desert now. And no one gave us a hidden chance that this thing would work. And if you look at the bottom four floors, that used to be the old Bonwood factory. Uh, and thanks to Justin, my our development, my development partner, he and I kind of navigated our way through this storm, and we converted that original block into a whole bunch of apartments. We added on two levels there, very similar to the other ski, and then we built on 187 room hotel over there and more apartments there. So that was 187 room hotel, 125 apartments, and 6,000 square meters of office. Um, retail. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it was around the time of 2010, the World Cup came along and that hotel was supposed to be a hotel for the World Cup team, for one of the World Cup teams. So I think I'm going to focus a little bit on the trends around, around um, this particular kind of project and repurposing buildings. And, and that's when I actually come to this one. And this one was repurposed for student accommodation. But again, the pundits proved us that we couldn't make this work. No, no student was gonna come, was gonna come here, but we made it cheap enough and make it cost effective enough for, to appeal to, to students to come here because here they could have their own apartment, literally their own bathroom, their own kitchenettes and be completely independent. And we called it my domain. And um, so, one of the things we added to this was that we gave it, um, uh, uh, basically created a um, bus system, or should I say a transportation system, our own Jamie shuttle. And we transported our students to Jamie steps uh, every half an hour on rotation. And that was the winner, giving students transport and keeping students connected on Wi-Fi from the dorm right up to Jamie Steps where UCT Wi-Fi could take over. Um, and that kind of like was a start then to, to my domain, which became its own successful story. And I'll tell you this because sometimes you can't plan for this, you know, this things just happen by default. And um, this was one of those default positions. Um, this was then my domain two, which uh, is an OBS. Uh, which is also an old clothing factory, which we demolished here, and we actually completely rebuilt that. So that's also quite a pretty story, and and she continues to this day. And then we come to this one. This is Woodstock Quarter. So Woodstock Quarter was a bunch of garages um, that uh, that um, we then demolished, and uh, we sold out uh, conventionally the scheme on the market. Uh, I always get my, my apartments wrong because Justin always corrects me and he's not here right now to help me. But I, but I think it's close to 350 odd apartments and there were in three blocks, um, A, B, and C. And there's a whole bunch of retail downstairs. 
Uh, we sold those blocks off. We're managing to attain that. And we still continue to look after this property. And while we're finishing it off and getting it better down, it was a lot of fun, this, this project. And um, yeah, it's, uh, and it has a lifeline of its own. I think well, that's one of the things I wanted to say to you is these precincts, the reason we do them so big is because they, they just create a life of their own. Um, I think to do 20 or 30 apartments in, in, in no man's land is dangerous. Um, it, 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 it can work, I'm not saying it won't work, but it, it, does, have its, it does have its challenges. Um, so one of the things I enjoyed about this particular project is that, oh, just going back uh, to this one, um, here, up there, uh, we have a, what we call a heat exchange system where the air cons of the hotel generated some waste heat. Believe me, there's a thing called waste heat. And we piped it, um, we pipe it to, 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 to some tanks and that those tanks warm the water up and that water kind of like it's fed to the apartments. Uh, and then what happens is the heat pump just differentiates the difference in temperature from whatever it was around 33 odd degrees to, to the 47 or 40 odd plus degrees that you need for, for, for showering. Um, I touch on this because uh, we do, in the projects that we do, we try to focus on, on, on some on environmental issues and energy saving and harvesting water. We harvest water out of this development as well. We did this here too. Initially, the water testing was all good. And then somewhere, somewhere upstream, someone's been throwing nonsense into the water and uh, we're getting some bad readings there now. We spend a fortune on the filtration system, which we no longer can use or would have to be uh, upgraded. Um, this one, we have, uh, we stumbled on a wonderful underground river that kind of runs through there. And, and um, we harvest water there. And during ground zero, we were harvesting water for literally the, the entire community. And they would come there and, 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 and grab water from, from, our, from our site at the time when we were building. Um, we, we supply the schools still this, to this day, still through an NGO called SAS, um, SAS Schools. Um, and, and, and that's also a really proud, uh, a, 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 a proud thing for me. Um, we're also using an, another job, another contract, which I'll touch on just now, uh, TABS, which is Thermal Activated Building Systems. Um, and, and, and maybe I'll share that with you now. But okay, this is a this is a also a refurb building which we finished very recently. It was a the old tramway building, tramway house. It was only like literally that there that wasn't there, and there was a building which we completely re refurbed and cleaned this up. And and with uh, Simon Thurska's development manager, we, we got this one handed over to our tenant Densu, who signed a long lease with us. Densu are the large, one of the largest uh, global media houses in the world. And again, you know, these companies are seeing something in Cape Town, which I don't think South Africans are even seeing, but there's skill base here, which I'll touch on just now. Um, just going back quickly to the ESG, uh, not ESG, to, uh, to, to, to some of our um, green building uh, um, initiatives. This year is, is, is the water harvesting system at Woodstock Quarter. And this year is the tap system at 358 Victoria. Um, which I'll get onto in a second. But what, while we're talking about this, um, I'm just going to give some investments, some advisory, uh, if I may. Um, so we all understand that the commercial at this stage is, is, is hammered and there's an abundance of space. And, and we really don't know what is best, best practice for conversions at this stage. We're kind of on a new frontier. One can bring in buzzwords like co-working and co-living. Um, though I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of co-living and, and, and co-working. Um, but what we need to address is the housing backlog. And, um, and I think that within the boundaries of, of the city, that there's a great opportunity here to be able to, to turn a lot of these uh, B-grade buildings into potentially uh, apartments that, that occupiers can use cost effectively. Now, uh, I'm not going to profess to know what a, what a shack costs to rent, but I, I know it costs some, some thousand rand a month. Or three, um, 
plus you add some transport to that, and, and very soon you had two people with that kind of income together, and then the affordability of a micro unit or an apartment in town is not far away. So I think there's been this wonderful closing of the gap uh, for affordability in the city. And, and I'm hoping that that trend will continue to pick up. Um, some people will, will, will think I'm being a bit optimistic with this mindset, but I think it's probably the start of, of an eclectic new, new city. Um, and, and again, it's, it's, it's because of market trends, because basically these apartments, you can get them for the same price as it five years ago. So there hasn't been any uptick in value, but people are looking for tenants. So it's opportunistic. I think it's a great time for, for, for some cheaper offerings in the in a city, um, especially for, for a readjusted um, uh, mindset and, 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 and a millennial mindset from, from the research that I've done. And again, um, the senior living is an underserviced uh, um, sector that I think inner city projects could also look towards accommodating that market. So, so some advice out there to you guys is look towards income funds with commercial properties, looking to sell them for liquidity reasons, because I think there's a bit going on at the moment. They're under some, a lot of LTV pressure, LTV meaning loan to value pressure. Um, there's a lack of tenants, commercial tenants, as we know, stayaways thanks to the pandemic. Uh, rationalization of office space will all lead to these empty spaces and buildings becoming available for a young developer to jump into and find their ways. I'm not going to tell you how to do it, but I'm sure there's some, going to be some in, innovative stuff coming out of the equation in the next year or two. So what's the problem? The problem is just very little economic growth. We have literally zero economic growth uh, and rights don't help. Uh, um, we need to find a way to, to influence international investors and the lack of international confidence is, is one thing and you can only blame the virus for so long, but ultimately we have to create some stimulus, some stimulus in, this, in the country. The government has done very little to stimulate. The government has very, done very little to help privatize. So very similar to the US and the UK where there has been a willingness and political willingness, I think our country government has, has done the opposite. And the other thing also the city councils need to do more City Council uh, need to curb their Fed budgets, I think, and give some relief, especially rates and taxes relief. It's all help. So we need a clearer democracy, I think, um, where we can bank this, put this South Africa globally with our opportunities. We can attract foreign investment. The world wants to be here, but they feel hamstrung by our policies and um, our non-investment friendly grounds. So what are we going to do to stimulate growth here? I'm going to use a simple case in point uh, very recently on the media. Australia, more people are returning to Australia than ever before. I mean, the last 30 years, I mean, not 30 years, and ever before, since after the Second World War, um, there's been this migration back to Australia. And why? Because there's been some startups, the financial sector in, in Australia is starting to take, eventually starting to find its ground, and, and, and people are migrating back, back, back home. And it's something we need to do in South Africa. We need to find something to attract back the brain drain of the last 30 years and more so the last 10 years. So we have to re-import our funds, our foreign funds back into South Africa. Um, and I think we're in for a golden era. South Africa is going to be in for a long golden era if we can just fix one or two small things. It doesn't take much. And, and I'm gonna say this with confidence because uh, we literally secured a tenant um, called 2U that bought a local startup called Get Smarter. And, and they had been around the Southern Hemisphere looking for a city, country to invest in, and they picked Cape Town. And they went on an R RPI, which is a request proposal. And um, they ultimately picked us because we had a piece of land which we had secured. It's called the Old House of Manatic site. And um, so this is the Old House of Manatic building here, which we converted to My Domain 3. Uh, with its some amenities and we focus. So I'm jumping a little bit around. It's back to my demand again. Um, you know, by offering some great amenities within the sector of the student environment, we we, we feel we, we're giving a, a, a you know a co-living, co-working, uh, cohabitation environment to to a student now again with his with his very own apartment, his uh, master, master, little master chef kitchens and libraries and all kinds of nice things that will keep you contained in this environment. Um, so, so to you, 
we're co we're confident in awarding us this 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 contract. And and technically speaking, why 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 Cape Town? Well, simply they said to us technically and logistically, it made a lot of sense to invest in South Africa um, as as their base home. And and what they do uh, for those that don't know what they do, they um, well, firstly they invest in South Africa because the rentals are very very attractive, probably the, somewhere the cheapest in the world. The people are smart and very employable, and and the the cost of living is is, was, is cheaper. So this four billion dollar business listed on the Nasdaq as invested in Cape Town or in the Western Cape, and we should have this building finished by the mid October for them. Um, and a little bit about these guys, they they do online um, education. So it's the fastest growing. The th COVID has probably been extremely friendly and um, has been extremely uh, rewarding for them in that they've managed to accelerate their business uh, during COVID. And recently, very recently, as in yesterday, they signed up uh, MIT and Harvard. So, so literally you can do uh, a Harvard course through to you out of Cape Town. It, it's as crazy as that. Um, and I'm gonna show you more or less what the, what the end product is gonna look like. Um, but when it's finished, uh, the little head of headquarters will look something like that, minus those two floors, because we're going for the MU2 scheme and not the MU3 scheme. And, um, but right now it looks something like that. And uh, I'm just gonna hop a little bit around this because I think this area, uh, as we know it, Salt River, Woodstock area is, is, is very tech friendly. It has a great, it's rich in people with skills. Um, it has an incredible telecommunication system that comes into what they call the Woodstock Exchange. It's uninterrupted. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's probably gonna be the next, by, by, by sheer nature of its, of its default position again, this area is what I think is gonna be the next tech hub of, 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 of Africa. Um, and again, I say that with confidence in that we all know where Amazon is going. Um, Amazon's literally going across the road. Um, and I don't know if it didn't actually get a thing on it, a little uh, clip on it, but it's, it's, it's going across the road from here uh, at, 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 at the River Club. And why Cape Town? There's a myriad of reasons why Cape Town. And there's an old saying that goes, just follow Amazon and wait for something to happen. Um, so what's my concern uh, with the world? I think the, the world is uh, highly leveraged. The, the, low, the interest rates hopefully won't come back and bite us with, with, with inflation because we can't do with any inflation right now or any inflation triggers in South Africa. We certainly can't do with any interest rate hiking because that's going to be a, a complete nightmare. Um, and and, and what we're coming back to is, is what is the workplace going to look like? Um, is it going to be hybrid working? Uh, is it going to be how affordable is it going to be? What is the office layout going to look like? I, I don't have the answers to that. Is hot desk going to become the norm? Some some companies are prescribing to it, some aren't. Some are saying two two days at work, three days at home, vice versa. Should st should, should staff come in at all, some days or not? Um, so I'm going to open you guys up to to ask me these questions, or maybe we can have an open uh, conversation about that over the next uh, what is that? Maybe 10, 15 minutes. Um, before I close off. And uh, I think that's my story for now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joram Carlo. That was very enlightening and insightful. Um, we have selected a few questions from the audience this evening. Um, the first question is, you spoke about asking your father's friends to guide you and help you save your business. It must have been hard to sell the equipment, but also heartwarming seeing how others benefited from the equipment. The question is, how important do you think that they is? And what would you advise? I'm what would sorry, you could you repeat that? Sorry, I completely lost you there for, for the last literally minute after equipment. <laughs> equipment, yes. So the question um, after referring to 
how you benefited um, also from seeing others benefit from the equipment that you provided them. Uh, the question is how important do you think having a mentor is um, and what advice be, uh, would you give for someone who's looking for uh, a mentor themselves? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I personally thought I was too proud to ask for help. And I think it's probably one of the large, biggest mistakes I ever made is, is actually the mentor will come to you when the student is ready. You know, um, it's sometimes somebody close to you that you would lastly think would be there for you, but it's the person you speak to the most. Um, that knows you best, that is also open and honest with you, regardless of your faults. So I, I, I picked this particular guy because um, I think he was my dad's friend. And because if my dad trusted him, I could trust him. Is that helpful? Yes. Um, so what would you advise if someone was to approach someone for mentorship? It, it's a, it's, I suppose in many ways, it's, it's, it's a feeling you get when you're with that person. I mean, just your perception, what you think they are and what they're about is the first step. And, you know, asking for a cup of coffee, often people don't have time for other people anymore. Um, reaching out to somebody is probably one of the hardest things you'll do in your life. Finding a good mentor, um, is not easy. So what advice would I give? I would say to just look closer to yourself first, what it is you're searching for and, and not expect the mentor to be there to serve you, but rather serve yourself first and then ask the questions. The mentor will find you because people are naturally wanting to help. It's just the nature of a human being. Okay, thank you. And you so the second question is that you detailed your experience in, ad uh, in adapting to the working world. Um, how did you overcome some of the challenges you faced? Oh. Personally, I had no choice. So what, what was my driver? I had brothers at school. I had a mother, I had a system around me that was very dependent on, on me having to generate revenue. And I had to feed them. It was as simple as that. I had to find a way to find money to feed my family. And, and if that's not enough, then I don't know what is enough. The next question, thank you so much for that. Um, the next question is, how do you compare redevelopment, RE development, or investment opportunities among Cape Town, Johannesburg, and Durban? What property types do you find attractive? So it's like kind of two questions. Yeah. It's, yeah, so, so, so Cape Town, I think, has its own special attractiveness to it and that we, we, we know this upper side has been pretty, it's kind of landlocked. So we know that there's a mountain, there's a sea, uh, you've got the seaboard on the other side and um, there's limited property available really. So would it be a good place to start? I'd say yes, find something here, yeah, yes. Eventually when the world does fly in Cape Town again, uh, and remember we are counter cyclical, so in, in seasons, so when Europe is on summer, um, or in winter, you know, they're looking for summer seasons. And, and we're just about one of very few offerings besides Buenos Aires and, and, and Australia that they can offer anything nice. Um, and, and I say this sensitively because we also quite cheap. So, so I'm not just saying Cape Town, I'm saying Durban is attractive as tourist nerds go. I know it's hard to talk tourism now because it's like the last thing anyone will be thinking about right now because for like the last 18 months, there have been no tourists, but it will come back. Um, so I'd say the tourism sector is one place to look because hotels are relatively cheap to buy, I think. Um, so, so there is an opportunity. 
converting commercial buildings to hotels or in the future for future cheaper accommodation should I say is an opportunity um, Johannesburg I'm, I'm, I'm less friendly with and I'll tell you why it's because Johannesburg changes all the time it's like today I remember the days when the early days in the 80s I, I went to a swimming contest to Hilbra literally the Hilbra swimming pool and it was the coolest place to be um, it was like Santon but Santon wasn't even on the cards no one knew where that was and then next thing, 10 years, I go past Joburg again and Hillbrow is a, not a place to be. And it's all Santon. And, and then it's no Santon anymore. It's Rosebank. And if it's not Rosebank, it's going to be somewhere else. So because there's just such an abundance of land, it just goes to where whichever institution throws the most money at it. Um, so be very wary about that. Um, but it, it does leave opportunities behind, you know. Uh, one man's scrap is another man's treasure, I suppose. Um, Durban has, its, has also migrated north, leaving huge pockets of, of, of vacant buildings in Durban itself. Durban has its own crime and grime of its own. But again, people need to live. People need places to stay. So there are certain opportunities there too. Thank you. Um, and what property types do you find attractive specifically? <sighs> the boring one but the most sustainable one is industrial. It's not pretty, it's a shed, but it's the one that I suppose has been the most consistent. And that's mostly because of online shopping, internet, people have, uh, it's, it's been stimulated by, 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 by the growth of online. Um, and it's been good for us. It's been a good anchor. Um, and I think it'll continue to be a good place to be. But the entry level, the barriers to entry into that market space is extremely difficult. Every single fund with cheap money is in that space. And for a young entrepreneur to be entering that space, maybe the smaller sheds uh, where you can multi cut them up into multi-service units where um, emerging brands are looking to go. I think that that's an opportunity. Maybe in the Salt River, uh, para area, para industrial area, Maitland, um, there's certainly... Uh, gaps there um, but um, as I said my passion I keep it's, uh, and I naturally migrate back to it is the regeneration of, of, of areas because this is what this is it's, it starts in the factories the multi-let units becomes offices startups techs tech industry the students are there people become used to the area and you know and I, and I show the streetscape because I hope one day we'll have a streetscape like that again you know when people are out in the streets um yeah, I hope to have answered that question. Yes, you did. Thank you so much. Um, you outlined um, many points as to where you think we as a youth could um, start. And so another question is, what uh, is a good start in building up equity and capital, firstly? And secondly, how do you go about getting investors as well as helping them trust you how would we go about getting investors as well as um, helping them trust us as a youth? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm a ground up kind of guy, as I said earlier, you know, I, I, and, and, and I'm maybe making an unfair statement in that, it, you know, if you don't know what the concrete smells like or how the sand binds, then you shouldn't be in this business. So finding experience on site, understanding what one brick on top of another one costs is a good start. And when you have that experience, you can sell your story. And when people know that you've been on the ground and they know that you can deliver, the capital will come. So I'm not prescribing and saying that you shouldn't be doing a property course and going to work. And what I mean by that is also, um, working in administrative uh, functions like like managing properties uh, on behalf of other com companies so once you build up that credibility and, and a little bit of know-how that goes a long way to convincing somebody to to back you um someone like myself uh, you know i'll probably be exiting the space in the next five to ten years and then looking to back younger guys to to 
So, so, but at the same time, passing on a few words of, of wisdom, but it's energy. It's about the want and the will. And, and, and to sell your story, to raise money, there's always money for a good story. There's always money for authenticity. There's always money for, for someone that has guts and grind. And to get that story across, it's got to be genuine and, and it's got to be real. And it's got to be the person on the other side of the table has got to know that you're willing to roll up your sleeves and, and jump into that site, boots and all, if, and I'm going to use the word shit, if the shit hits the fan. Because it's going to happen. <laughs> I don't know if I, if I, if I answered that question because I, 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 I think I will. Okay. Um, thank you so much. And the next question is, which municipal policies did you use to your advantage um, as a developer in the past, even now, example, affordable housing schemes or tax exemptions? Look, if you're going to make it do a development for tax exemptions, then you're starting already off the wrong bat. Um, there's no ways that those must be little periphery add-ons. If you're going to do something in an urban development zone, well, that's just lucky. If you're going to do something because of Section 21, um, that's just lucky. You, you shouldn't be doing developments because of that. The developments must stand on the fundamentals for what they are. If you end up getting some tax um, relief, remember at the end of the day, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You have to pay it back somewhere. So I don't think developments fly because of tax incentives necessarily. I think there's not enough done in this space to stimulate. As I said earlier, I think in my talk, uh, when the government needs to get more involved in stimulating these nodes, especially housing nodes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. What are the biggest challenges one can expect in rural development projects compared to urban commercial development projects? Our rural is community-based. So as long as you, I think we, we did the first Ada shed in Philippi, which was a very, very powerful community. We involved the community in everything we did. Uh, we literally sourced from around the community. We involved the community in, in, in bidding, in tendering. So it wasn't, we didn't see it as walking in Chabas and just doing our own thing. We, we involved the community as much as we, as we could. So rural developments, I think, subscribes to that largely. Um, and, 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 it had, and it creates its own opportunity because it's incredible what comes out of these rural areas. The skill base, it's there. Um, it's just, it's there. Uh, and I'm a, and I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of it. I really do, do wish to do more of those. Um, versus the city, the city is more mainstream. You know, um, Make sure you pick a good builder because there's going to be challenges in town of its own. Um, and, and, and make sure you surround yourself with, 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 good, with, a, with a good professional team. Thank you. The next question. Um, what's your opinion of inclusionary housing requirements within private developments in inner city areas of Cape Town? Great. I wish it became more, more, more mandatory. Um, and I'm going to say that with caution in that it needs to happen if we're going to close the inequality gap of sorts in some little way. Uh, makes no sense to be catching buses from Kailiche and from Google it into town and spending three hours in the traffic coming to work. It's madness. Everywhere else in the world, it's integrated in inclusionary housing. It's, it's happening. Why it doesn't happen faster in Cape Town? I can't answer you, but I would certainly subscribe to it. Okay, thank you. Last question. Um, a common misconception is that affordable housing delivery is a state housing delivery tool, but I'm glad you mentioned the issue of housing backlog in Cape Town. Does the Swish company have some affordable housing projects in the pipeline? Um, we don't immediately have, but we certainly have plans. When I say affordable, I'd like to think everything we've done in Woodstock and Salt River has been affordable. Um, Upper East Side is affordable. Uh, 
if we took Weinberg and we broke that into apartments from a student resi. So, so here's the thing, um, you know, what do, we, what do we service first? An affordable student market first or a housing market first? Does one say that the one is less worth than the other? We'd like to think we want to start with a student first and we'd like to find a way to accommodate that first. And ultimately, that's what Weinberg was, um, to find an entry-level space for an independent unit that gave somebody dignity, that didn't have to share and walk down the passages half naked, to be able to just have their own space with their own bathroom, their own kitchen, affordable space. That was our first goal. And I think we've achieved that. Thank you so much, Mr. Jerome Carter and Franchi. This has been Thank you, inspirational. Um, now we will do the lucky draw. Um, this is for a book that came highly recommended by you um, called The Art of a Good Life by Rolf Dobelli. And the winner is Sive Mankai. Okay. Well, if I can share a little bit about the book, it's not a Bible for me, but it's almost become like a, a secondary Bible and that I, I've read it for three or four times already. And it's just a humble reminder about simplicity and just keeping things simple and authentic and real. And that it's, it's no better for a man to run around with five Bentleys than a man with a Bucky. Life is the same. The happiness, find the happiness index because it's within all of us. And it doesn't, it's not shown in wealth that I can assure you. That's just, that's all just nonsense. Um, so this book keeps reminding me about that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that is the end of the Property Leaders webinar. I hope you all enjoyed. Thank you again, Giancarlo Lanfranchi, for this inspiring um, talk. And hope everyone can stay safe. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Molly. Thanks very much, guys. And thank you for your time. And good luck for the Euros, whichever team you support. Be at Switzerland or with the other one, Spain. Bye, Bye-bye. Bye.